We're coming up on this final story here about the gray zone. So interesting things have happened. Uh, if you remember, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, uh, the gray zone was actually, they were the first ones, their self, Mondo Weiss and uh, Electric Intifada. They were the ones that actually debunked the New York Times uh, sexual assault story, right? They were the first ones to debunk that. And there was pushback and criticism. Max Blumenthal went on to rising and debated against Robbie about that, but they were the first. They were the first. Okay. I say that because uh, recently uh, The Intercept also has pointed out information uh, about that same story. We covered this a couple of days ago that one of the journalists, uh, Anat uh, Shorts, actually was a former member of the IDF. <laughs> <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. Former member of the IDF. And also it was discovered by Z Squirrel that she had liked uh, genoc uh, genocidal tweets on Twitter, uh, that she was definitely a Zionist, obviously. And apparently she wasn't a journalist at all. All of a sudden she became a freelance journalist right after October 7th. Uh, so there was a lot revealed there and we covered that story. However, what I said when I talked about that uh, information that was revealed by The Intercept is that it was very weird to me that they did not credit The Gray Zone or Mondo Weiss or Electric Intifada for being the first to debunk that story. And I also noticed that when The Gray Zone, or excuse me, when uh, The Intercept revealed the information that they, re they revealed about that story, there was no pushback in reference to the left uh, quote unquote media uh, space uh, it was just accepted as fact. But when the gray zone first debunked that story, there was pushback, right? Well, the gray zone has finally spoke, <laughs> spoken out about that. <laughs> and we're going to get into that uh, from Max and Aaron. They have quite a bit to say here about how these events transpired and also how they feel about the fact that people like Ryan Grimm, we're just going to say the name here, Ryan Grimm, and other members of The Intercept and other meters, members of the left independent media space decided to just pretend like the gray zone did not debunk this story first and also decided to just give all the credit to The Intercept knowing that The Intercept, they even read some of the work of The Gray Zone on the interview with Democracy Now. Let's go ahead and get into this clip here from Aaron and Max. If you've watched the gray zone, if you followed us, you've seen that from the start, we've been calling out this scam that there was sexual violence committed by Hamas militants on October 7th. Um, this has been going on for a long time. These allegations were rolled out precisely at a time when Israel was under, you know, global scrutiny for its atrocities in Gaza. And this has been deliberately used to try to deflect from that, to deflect for the horrors going on in front of our eyes. Uh, and now though the times the, the the new york times which put out a story in late december which we debunked at, at the gray zone is walking back uh some of its core claims uh and this comes via the intercept the intercept did a story about this picking up on the reporting we did which we're going to talk more about in a second because they've done so i think in a really disingenuous way by not crediting the people who debunked the story that they're now following up on but they did a pause here for a second. How would you guys feel is when I did this show, I didn't credit, <laughs> I didn't give credit to the sources. <laughs> like, how would you feel if I just pretended like I wrote these articles? How would you feel? Right? So that's not ethical journalism. And I don't think this has anything to do with the information that the gray zone reported. I think it has to do with uh, gatekeeping and personality differences, which I will get into in just a bit. But that's really what this is about. Let's hit some important admissions from the New York Times. And one of them is that the Times is now walking back its initial claim. So this is what the Times tells The Intercept now. They say that on October 7th, quote, there may have been systematic use of sexual assault. That's what a New York Times reporter told The Intercept. But that's not what the New York Times said in its story, which is still up. It says that they've uncovered, quote, a pattern of rape, mutilation, and extreme brutality against women in the attacks on Israel. So there's no qualifier there. There's no, they may have under, uh, used a pattern of rape and sexual violence. Uh, they're declaring that Hamas did. But now because they've become under so much scrutiny, including from the, the, the gray zone, they're walking that back. And, you know, 
the impetus for this retraction, this tacit retraction by the Times, was that one of their contributors to this story, an Israeli woman named uh, Anad Schwartz, has come under scrutiny uh, because she was caught liking genocidal anti-Palestinian posts on Twitter. Uh, she was caught by the Twitter account Zay Squirrel, which then The Intercept followed up on. Yep. So uh, follow that account, you guys, on Twitter. Zay Squirrel, Z-E-I Squirrel. Let's just, we'll, we'll, we'll sort of start from the beginning here. We came out right out of the gate when this story came out, exposing demonstrably false testimonies by supposed witnesses, inconsistencies in those testimonies, impossibilities, uh, and uh, discrepancies between actual evidence and what was claimed in that article. <clears throat> what we found was a really unprofessional rehearsal of an attempt to produce atrocity propaganda on behalf of Israel to justify its ongoing genocide in Gaza, which is infuriating. And I said from the beginning that um, this was one of the worst cases of journalistic malpractice on its face that I've seen since Judith Miller and her WMD lies that were published in the New York Times, fed to her by Bush administration neocons. But I, and I also said that I, before we were done with him, Jeffrey Gettleman, the lead author of this article, would have to answer for what he did. So Jeffrey Gettleman was sort of compelled to issue a follow-up piece, which was obviously a response to us, <laughs> as well as the Electronic Intifada and Mondo Weiss, who were also leading the way on debunking this article. Let me go ahead and, and pause it there. And we're going to go to the uh, next part there, because most of you guys already know about this part of the story. Uh, I want to get to this piece here about them uh, not receiving credit, because I still I really do have a problem with that. Like that really bothers me uh, for people to sit up here and pretend like they don't know where that information came from when they know damn well where that information came from. Uh, it, it, we don't know how this is going to end up and it's important to keep the pressure on. And, you know, I give the intercept credit for keeping the pressure on. Um, yeah, they the said something important. Yeah, yeah. no, the reporting here was important. They, they picked up on something that we missed, which, which is after a Z squirrel, which they're really picking up on exposes a not yeah. short role. They found a podcast of hers in which she made some really damning admissions and they reported it. On that, and they also got the story from inside the New York Times that there are people uncomfortable with Gettleman's story, and that the Daily, the, the podcast, couldn't do an episode about it. That's important, but uh, I guess I guess what we're not going to get into what's unacceptable, in my opinion, is they're going out of their way to refuse to acknowledge the people who first debunked this story and who created the controversy around the story, which they're now picking up on. Yep. Let me pause before Max comes back in. Let me tell you a little story, okay? So when I talk about gatekeeping, like there's gatekeeping like in every space, I feel like, whether it's academia, whether it's, you know, the corporate world, whether it's work, you probably got gatekeeping at your job. So what I have noticed in independent media is that there are gatekeepers here too. <laughs> so it's like, for whatever reason, actually, I will get into the reasons. I know the reasons. It has been decided by some, the gatekeepers, that there are certain people in this space, even those that are investigative journalists, that they are not going to credit or they are not going to acknowledge. Or if they do acknowledge them, it's only going to be in the form of a smear. That is what the gatekeepers have decided. And we've seen these gay people, the majority reports, the TYT, you know, they're gatekeepers. So basically the way it works is that if the gatekeepers do not give you the shout out for your work, oftentimes you will go unnoticed. The, the, the difference here, I think, with the gray zone is that they are big within their self, right? So that they don't really need to have to have the shout out from TYT or Majority Report. Like they are pretty well known when it comes to investigative journalism and when it comes to even independent media, right? So people know them because they put in a lot of work. That being said, 
<laughs> if those gatekeepers pretend like the work that you have done does is does not exist or they don't acknowledge that you're the one who did the work in turn what can happen is that the gatekeeper ends up getting the credit for reading the work and you'll see this with Ryan Grimm reading some of the things that you actually did and the gatekeeper will get all the credit for it and Ryan Grimm is one of those gatekeepers too and Ryan Grimm has been on this show so it is what it is <laughs> you can't come to me and say I wasn't willing to talk to someone that I disagree with Ryan Grimm has been on this show and he's one of those gatekeepers and the intercept has has changed a lot since and Glenn Greenwald has explained this multiple times since he left the intercept. So it is I would consider that to be unethical journalism when you don't give the credit where it's due. And that's how that's how I was taught when I, I studied broadcast journalism, I was taught that you're supposed to give the credit and I just feel like it's unethical when you don't do that. But another damn thing. I got some things to say about democracy now too, because democracy now they're the ones that did the interview with Ryan Grimm and with Jeremy from the intercept and democracy. Now they sit here and they just act like, Oh, we'll get to that in a second. Let me finish this. Yeah. I mean, let's start with the Ryan Grimm and Daniel bogus law article, which was an important piece citing sourcing inside the New York Times on the New York Times decision to shelve its daily podcast based on Gettleman and Company's Hamas mass rape hoax article. Um, why did that happen? Why did it decide to shelve the podcast? Because we exposed that article, not the intercept. We did it. Electronic Intifada did it. Mondo Weiss did it. Mondo Weiss doesn't get enough credit because they the, a lot of their reporting was anonymous uh, or their, their debunking was done anonymously, but they yeah. did an important job. They've been doing an important job. All these three this publications and other Twitter users have been doing an important job, not only with this story, but with Zaka, the fake aid, the fake rescue organization, with uh, all the atrocity fabrications, the Hannibal directive use on October 7th. We've been out there from the beginning so how can The Intercept tell the story of why this article fell apart and why The New York Times decided to shelve that podcast without mentioning us? It is, that is it, itself journalistic malpractice. You're not telling your readers why it happened. Yeah, they're actually, they're actually repeating what Jeffrey Gettleman did because after we exposed Jeffrey Gettleman's fraud along with Mondo Weiss and Electronic Intifada, as we talked about earlier, Gettleman wrote that follow-up piece where he had to address his unspecified critics. He, he says the word critics multiple times. Critics, critics say this. He doesn't cite us and he doesn't acknowledge us, but he's responding to the points we raised. We raised. So basically, The Intercept did the exact same thing, which is basically yep. erase the fact that we we debunked the story that created this controversy. Um, uh, and so it, there's it's weird there. Even like they're actually emulating his behavior. Because, and why uh, we could speculate, why do even independent journalists have such contempt for other independent journalists? I mean, you know, the most charitable version is like, you know, I personally have been very critical of The Intercept. I make fun of them because they bought into all these scams that we've debunked, Russiagate, Syria Dirty War, the Hunter Biden laptoping, Russian disinformation. Pause. So did you hear the stories that Aaron just mentioned? That's important. Uh, the Syria, right? The Syria War, Russiagate. I didn't think they would have fallen for that one, but apparently that one as well, right? So they, they don't like it. Like the gatekeepers don't like it when you prove them wrong. Especially they just kind of look at you like, oh, who are you supposed to be? You know, like we're the intercept, that kind of thing. The Hunter Biden laptop story, you have to remember, remember Glenn Greenwald wanted to publish that story through the intercept. They wouldn't allow Glenn Greenwald to publish the Hunter Biden laptop story. That's why Glenn, Green, Glenn Greenwald left The Intercept because they wouldn't let him publish that story. So, it just, look, the thing is gatekeepers, that's what this is really about is gatekeeping. 
They control the narrative. So this doesn't just happen in mainstream media, you guys. As you can see, this happens in independent media as well. And as long as the gatekeepers continue to gatekeep, it makes it more difficult for people to hear uh, the truth here and where it actually came from. Uh, the Ukraine proxy war, they were pretty weak on. I mean, we can go on and on. And so it's not nice to probably have to acknowledge people who criticize you and make fun of you. But there's also such thing as minimal journalistic courtesy. And for all my criticisms of The Intercept, I've never not acknowledged when they've done really important reporting. For example, Ryan Grimm helping to expose the U.S. rule a role in the coup in Pakistan and overthrowing Imran Khan. It's really important. And I'll always credit that. But they refuse consistently to uh, offer the same courtesy. And in this case, it's just so egregious as, and we have more examples of it. Let me pause here for a second. So same thing. Um, I, I've given Ryan Grimm credit in reference to like his reporting about Imran Khan. You guys have seen me. I've covered that story a couple times on the show. I, I will read an article from the intercept. And if it's by Ryan Grimm, I will tell you it's by Ryan Grimm. Like, just because I don't, just because he's not my favorite person, <laughs> And I do still consider him to be a gatekeeper just because he's not my favorite person. That doesn't mean I'm not going to pretend like that's his work. That doesn't mean like I'm not going to give credit where credit is due for him. However, on the other hand, it does mean that you see what I mean? So this is what happens with the gatekeepers. They're not willing to give credit where credit is due simply because they don't like you and they don't like you because you proved them wrong on their own reporting. Isn't that really messed up? Ain't that some shit? So when you see this interview with Democracy Now!, okay, when they actually announced the story, here's Democracy Now!, they announced it on Twitter, a major New York Times investigation into the violence of October 7th has come under intense criticism both inside and outside the newspaper. And you see they interviewed Ryan and they interviewed uh, Jeremy, right? Again, Democracy Now!. So when you go to the interview, we'll go to the part with Ryan. This is who they chose to interview about this story. Now, here's the problem, folks. Do you think Democracy Now! doesn't know who the gray zone are? Aaron Monte used to work for Democracy Now! Aaron Monte used to sit right on that screen, just like Amy Goodman. He used to work there. So it's not that Amy Goodman doesn't know who Aaron is. It's not that Amy Goodman doesn't know who Max Blumenthal is. So what's going on there? <laughs> gatekeeping, more gatekeeping. You know why? Because democracy now is often funded by Democrat donors. Under the guise of pretending to be independent, right? And oftentimes as journalists, we have something that we think we're going to be able to prove. We report it out and then we can't quite get it. Like it just, it, we just don't land the story. But what the Times did is they wrote is they is they wrote the story anyway but that gets you then to the daily episode so this article comes out at the very end of december as the new york times always does it's it's landmark pieces get turned into episodes of their flagship podcast the daily but immediately after the story came out it started coming under criticism because as jeremy pointed out a lot of the named subjects of the story have enormous credibility problems and so that's this starts getting pointed out inside the Pause. Okay, this part here about the uh, a lot of the victims or the witnesses that came forward have uh, credibility problems. Where was that re first reported? That was first reported with the gray zone. They were the ones to tell you that the witnesses were not credible, that they found like these little holes like in their stories. So again, Ryan Graham, why don't you mention that? Why don't you say that the gray zone had actually reported that the witnesses were not found to be credited because he don't want to shout them out on democracy now. I, I, I. Times the producers of the daily have their own kind of uh, fact checking process where they go over the stories and the original script that was you know produced for that first episode had to be discarded because the producers there couldn't stand behind it. So they redrafted a second script, which had a lot of caveats and was closer to the first version that I laid out uh, just now. Uh, which is in, which is an, an interesting podcast episode and is something worth exploring. But if they had aired that, it would have raised questions about why they were walking away from the certainty of the original piece. So we reported. 
So this is the part that's also important that, you know, that podcast episode that Max was referring to. So again, <laughs> it's kind of helpful here to mention, you know, why that episode did not air because of the reporting from the gray zone, because what they found out uh, from those witnesses, and they were saying that it was a lie about the October 7 uh, sexual assaults. So again, that's important for people to know. But Ryan, of course, leaves that out. On uh, the kind of machinations inside uh, the New York Times about this, the controversy, uh, the disputes that were going on. And since then, uh, as Vanity Fair reported, uh, the New York Times has, rather than reviewing the kind of journalism that, that went into this, uh, they are Kind of, they are launching launching a leak investigation to try to figure out who's talking to us. And he did the same thing, right? He did the same thing in reference to rather reviewing the journalism that went into uh, debunking the story. So he did the same thing that he accused the New York Times of doing. So you see these gatekeepers. So check this out. In February, one of the reporters behind the New York Times investigation, the Pulitzer Prize winning reporter Jeffrey Gettleman, spoke at a conference on conflict related sexual violence hosted by Columbia University. He talked about the piece. I did some stories about hostages and pretty soon, I mean, maybe, I don't know, within the first few days of, of this attack, we were hearing reports of rape and mutilations of, of women. We heard it right away. And I don't, I, I, maybe people in this room remember those videos of the female soldiers being taken away and the body of that, that one woman, Shawnee Locke, in the back of a pickup truck. So what's interesting is, so she goes to this guy, Jeffrey Gettleman, right? This guy all the way over at Columbia University who was wrong, right? Who was incorrect. But you don't mention the people who were correct. You just, when it comes to mentioning the people who were correct, you mention that the, the intercept because they are the approved investigative journalists of the so-called left. They're approved by other people who do the gatekeeping as well. They're approved. They get the thumb of approval from Democracy Now. They get the stamp of approval from Majority Report. They get the stamp of, of, of approval from the Jacobin DSA types. So it's okay to bring them on in reference to what they found about those stories. But you don't bring on the outlet that actually were the first ones to debunk the, for the story in the first place, mainly because you don't feel that they're reporting uh, in reference to Syria and in reference to Russiagate. You don't feel that it supported your narrative at that point in time. And they proved you wrong. Amy Goodman I had to tell you, like I said, Amy Goodman, she come from a lot of privilege. She's another one. Family of Harvard's, <laughs> I tell you, she comes from a lot of privilege. And it's just really astounding to me that the Intercept says it and everybody cheers it on and says, let's get this story out there, go on to every show. But when the gray zone recovered, actually debunked this first, you didn't see those same people cheering them on. In fact, even someone like Emma Vigilin, she's a part of that same gatekeeping bullshit, forgot to say during our coverage, Ryan Grimm and Jeremy Scahill and DR Bogus Law's awesome reporting on the New York Times outrageous conduct regarding the mass, we'll say assault here, propaganda piece. Credit to Z Squirrel for their part in digging this up. One of the few great accounts left here. So you see how you see these gatekeepers, Emma Vigilin, the majority reports, all these people see how she can shout out the intercept. Because again, Ryan Grimm is the DC bureau chief of the intercept. He has access to the squad. He wrote a book about the squad and published it recently. So they buddy up with someone like him because he has access to those politicians. Now, Aaron actually came out and said, or came forward, I shouldn't say, I'm sorry, I got to watch my words on here. Aaron came forward and said, if you want to understand why Ryan Grimm and Jeremy Scahill don't want to credit the journalist who first debunked the New York Times story, here's one reason, not confident to let facts speak for themselves. They're still going out of their way to pay lip service to the narrative. Here, Ryan 
declares that the idea that there would be no assault on October 7th is not taken seriously by pretty much anybody who understands kind of war and violence. First of all, October 7th wasn't a war. This was a one day guerrilla operation in a very limited time frame. To frame it in the context of a war is in fact not serious. Second, that's not how you approach allegations. An allegation needs to be backed by credible evidence. In the absence of any credible evidence, there's no need to pay lip service to the allegation unless you're pandering. So he was referring to what Ryan said here, and I can play this for you really quick as well. Two ways to think about what happened on October 7th. The first way is that it was a day of extraordinary mayhem and violence. The Israeli defenses melted away. Not only did you have you know, several thousand Hamas fighters stream across the fence, but you also had hundreds of civilians, some associated with gangs come across. And in that context, the idea that there would be no sexual assault is not taken seriously by pretty much anybody who understands kind of war and violence. That's one way to think about October. Two ways to... So to to Aaron's point there, first of all, there there is a such thing called investigation and collecting evidence. And that was one of the things that uh, Max pointed out on Rising was that there was no forensic evidence. So you know, how can you prove that that actually took place? And two, it wasn't a war at that point in time. But yeah, as as like a journalist, like there needs to be an investigation. You can't just say, well, of course this happened because that's what happens in war. You still have to do an investigation. Caitlin Johnstone is a real one. And she came forward and said a whole media industry is sprouting up around mainstream journalists just reading the gray zone and presenting its findings as their own original reporting because the gray zone is considered naughty enough to steal from. And I couldn't have said it better myself. She's 100 percent correct there. And if you guys are on Twitter, you can see this all over Twitter. You can see it all over Twitter, how people were just, everybody's giving the intercept and Ryan Grimm their kudos, pretending like nothing happened prior to. Uh, here's another one here from Aaron Mate. He is actually correcting this woman here where she said, Max Blumenthal and Aaron Mate of the gray zone slam left-wing outlets, democracy now, and the intercept because they've reported China's mistreatment of Uyghurs and Assad's chemical attacks in Syria. Blumenthal and Mate dismissed these facts as Western imperialist propaganda. We'll get into that in just a second. But first and foremost, uh, in reference to, just pay attention to what she said, mistreatment of the Uyghurs and Assad chemical attacks in Syria. So you have to remember again, uh, Aaron Mate actually won an award, right, for covering his coverage in Syria. Like they just don't give people awards for making shit up. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's just so he responds to this and said, correction. Uh, if you watch the actual clip, we don't challenge the claim of China's mistreatment of Uyghurs. We challenge the claim of the Uyghur genocide. There's a clear difference between mistreatment and genocide. The latter is indeed imperial propaganda, which is why you can't even quote us properly. An actual genocide is what's happening in Gaza right now. And yes, we scrutinize allegations of Syrian government chemical attacks by reporting on the available facts, including the OPCW leaks. By contrast, just like Uyghur genocide, our independent and establishment media colleagues parrot Mike Pompeo, John Bolton, and Anthony Blinken. So, I interviewed Aaron like, um, yes, I interviewed him right when I think he was reporting on the Uyghur genocide. And I did ask him about that. And one of the things that he said was, if there was a genocide happening, don't you think you would hear about it somewhere? And he said, what does the State Department say? And so I actually covered that on the show where I looked up what the State Department said in reference to the Uyghurs. And they said they had no evidence to prove that there was a genocide of the Uyghur people. So to his point, mistreatment and genocide are two different things. Obviously, like the genocide in Gaza, it's everywhere. The genocide in the Congo has also been reported. So notice how she conflates the two, mistreatment and genocide. 
And then two, I don't know how many times I got to bring up the Syria thing on the show, because what's really weird to me is that people who get the Palestine, like they get that issue right. They still don't get the Syria issue right. When they won awards on this, they've debunked this multiple times. Like, I don't know what else needs to be done. Right. But the gatekeepers, it's kind of like this unknown code that for the gatekeepers, you don't shout out the intercept, or excuse me, you don't shout out the gray zone unless you're trying to smear them. I kid you not, man. I kid you not. These people want awards. In fact, did you guys see this? So Max Blumenthal won an award just recently. <laughs> I can't make this up. I can't make this up. It says right here. So this is the, the Pierre the Pierre Spray Award. He just won this. Top prize, Max Blumenthal. It says right here, almost all of the reports on the current US-backed Israeli war on Gaza came to us heavily laced with mis misinformation and ideas, misinformation and lies, excuse me. That is why the work of Max Blumenthal, who has the benefit of in-depth reporting on Israel and Gaza in previous wars in the gray zone has not only uh, been invaluable, but also indispensable. Most importantly, in rigorously sourced reports such as October 7 testimonies reveal Israel's military shelling Israeli citizens, as well as Israeli October 7 poster child was killed by Israeli tank, eyewitnesses reveal. He has brought to light truths otherwise assiduously ignored in mainstream media. His work has been significant enough to elicit a tribute in the form of a shyly crafted smear job in the Washington Post. We're proud to acknowledge the importance of Blumenthal's work with the Pierre Spray Journalist Award. You know, I don't know. I mean, I don't see... I don't see these organizations just giving out awards to people for lying, <laughs> you know, Aaron Mate also got the same award in 2020 top prize. Aaron Mate, we are awarding the top 2022 Pierre spray journalism prize to Aaron Mate for his work published on real clear investigations, the Aaron Mate Substack, and his pushback videos on the gray zone site. Throughout the year, Mate reports on Washington's true objectives in the Ukraine war, such as urging regime change in Russia. Biden exposes U.S. aims in Ukraine and his continued work dissecting establishment propaganda on issues such as Russian interference in the U.S. politics or the war in Syria have stood in welcome, often unique contrast to mainstream media. His imperialist reporting excuse me, I lost my place. Oh, his imperious reporting give the lie to the charge of disinformation routinely leveled by those whose nostrums he challenges. His interviews on pushback serve as a model of informative elucidation, elucidation as demonstrated in appearances with former Congressman Dennis Kucinich on the collapse of the progressive peace lobby or with retired Colonel Douglas McGregor on the U.S. military high commands changing views on the Ukraine war. Notably, he has highlighted the role of social media companies in shaping public perceptions of Russian interference, as in his December 18th, 2020 article, 2022 article on Twitter's role in that effort. His reporting of the facts belying the allegation that the Syrian government gassed civilians in Dalma in 2018, citing credible evidence from whistleblowers, has been vehemently denounced by the U.S. and other state-supported organs, but never refuted. It is our view that the Pierre Spray would have heartily applauded Mate's work and that he richly deserves this award. So again, you know, it's just like, like I told you, the gatekeepers, man, gatekeepers are not gonna, you know how hard it is to get these awards? But it has already been announced because of the reporting on Syria. Because of reporting on Russiagate, because of reporting on the Ukraine war, it has been, you know, it's kind of just like this on the down low thing for the gatekeepers. 
not to give any credit to the gray zone. Don't shout out the gray zone. Stay away from the gray zone. If you ever mention them, you smear the gray zone. Gatekeepers.